Welcome back for True Crime, a conversation with Nanette Burstein. It is our closing session. Nanette Burstein directed the documentaries On the Ropes, which was nominated for the Oscar in 1999, The Kid Stays in the Picture, American Teen, and The Feature Going the Distance, as well as numerous, numerous episodes for television. Gringo, The Dangerous Life of John McAfee is her most recent feature. Burstein joins us to discuss delving into a highly contentious true crime story. She is joined on stage by Tom Powers, and we will start by rolling a clip. Uh, so uh, this film had its world premiere uh, two days ago. Yes. Uh, so yes. It, and you finished it uh, how many days ago? Uh, it's about f like a four days before that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so it's uh, it's been a, a marathon race uh, or sprint uh, to the sprint. finish sprint. <laughs> finish sure. line this summer. Um, when I look at your uh, film career, films like On the Ropes, Kid Stays in the Picture, American Teen. Uh, they don't uh, necessarily point to the kind of intensity of this film. Right. Uh, I mean, the, in the making of this film, you've experienced a lot of intimidation. You've, you were in Belize against uh, t talking to people who are uh, suspected of murder. Um, th there's like a whole, this is on a different level than anything you've done before. Did, 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 were you conscious of that going into it? I mean, I was somewhat conscious. I, I didn't know, uh, sorry, this feels very loud, but I didn't know exactly what I was gonna find that I, I mean, I knew um, there was another murder that it, uh, he was perhaps implicated in that hadn't been reported. Um, but beyond is, is that, that. Is that something that you had uh, kind of gotten through your colleagues who, uh, who yes. were working on this? Yeah, yeah. Um, Jeff Wise, who's a journalist who'd been following John in the press for a long time, um, had uh, uncovered that and a couple of people that were actually involved in it, and, uh, or one person, um, and then we uncovered a second person. So already I knew that, but as far as whether it was um, 
whether John had been involved in this other murder that had been very public, which he was a person of interest in, and this rape that I uncovered, and you know his some of his other crazy behavior, I was not really aware of until I was already in the mix. <laughs> <laughs> Too late. <laughs> Um, it, uh, we can bring up uh, house lights so that we can uh, be more at one with the, uh, with the audience here. Otherwise, it's just a black uh, curtain in front of us. Um, uh, so um, can you describe some of the uh, intimidation that you felt in the making of, the process of this film? Well, a lot of the intimidation was from John himself. Um, who uh, initially was hesitant to be interviewed, and I thought maybe he would come around. And um, he, at a certain point, I realized he wasn't. But he would email me constantly, and um, some of the emails were nice, and some of them were even like weirdly flirty, and then other ones were very, very hostile and threatening. And especially as the year went on, um, and. There was a moment, I think, that was really the only moment that I was afraid, really, truly afraid. And uh, he had, I had ambushed him in one of his debates. Finally, I'm like, OK, he's not going to sit down with me for an interview. We've had this cyber relationship. We've talked on the phone. But I want to meet him in person. Maybe he'll let me ask him a few questions. So I, I came to one of his events in New York City and, and surprised him there. And uh, I thought he would recognize me. He actually didn't seem to recognize me. I thought, well, it, you've been emailing this person for 10 months. Like, haven't you Googled me? But I don't know. He was like, really? You're Nanette, huh? Um, and, then he start, and then he walked away. And then he started, a half hour later, he started writing me very hostile emails for the next 24 hours, even in the middle of the night. Um, and the last email was, which I include in the film, is you are the Satan. And like every, it was like a bad police song. Every breath you take, every move you make. <laughs> it wasn't I'll just be watching you either. It was I will make it my life's mission to take you down. Um, you are my you know, final mission in life. And, uh, and, and then he describes he, you as his magnum opus. Well, in a different email, yeah. yes, yes. Everything is very larger than life with John. And uh, the, but the, the thing that freaked me out was that was a very hostile email. But then he sent me a text message five minutes later. Um, and I was alone. And uh, it said, I have very, something very precious to send you. Can you tell me your address? And all I knew is he could still be in New York, and he's got a license to carry bodyguard. And I'm like, move away from the windows, you know? And I was freaked out. And then I, ca I call my husband, who's a war reporter, and he's like, Pfft. he totally laughs at me, <laughs> thinks it's ridiculous. So I'm like, oh, OK, I'm just being paranoid. Um, but there was definitely moments in Belize. I mean, there were a lot of people that were in John's world that came from you know, the, the toughest gang in, in Belize City. Um, and while they were seemingly nice to us, they, you just didn't know. And the more trips you make to a place like this, and the more people are familiar with your presence, we started to get nervous. There had been a couple of murders of Americans in Belize, so we started to, to have security with us. Um, and uh, how much does that get in your head? Uh, and, and how do you handle uh, having that in your head? Well, and I live in denial in life, so I'm totally <laughs> fine with it. <laughs> no, I was, I mean, I, I just put it out of my mind. I, I maybe perhaps foolishly, but um, I mean, you do look around and you make sure, you know, you're safe and, and try to be smart and calculating and not be foolish. But if you, if you get afraid, you're not going to be able to do your job. So in this reporting, uh, you do a lot of interviews with people in Belize who knew John McAfee uh, there. There's a lot of rumors that uh, swirl around the murder of Greg Fall, mm -hmm. uh, his, his neighbor. Um, what was your process in sorting out uh, rumor from truth? Um, it was, I mean, there were a lot of rumors. There were a lot of tall tales. Um, it was really finding the people that had been directly involved with him and making sure that there was always more than one source on something 
that could, where the stories lined up exactly. The people that didn't, you know, that couldn't have corroborated in lining up their stories. And if there was more than two or three or four and, and whatever was on record, that it all matched up. I mean, I heard all kinds of stories, like, like that John had people enslaved in mines. I heard, you know, he was a major drug dealer. I mean, I heard all kinds of things, uh, that there were two other murders. Perhaps some of it was true, but I couldn't substantiate any of it. None of what you just said is in the film. No, no. not in the film. No, not at all. No, I mean, that's the point is, like, you really have to be careful that you don't just believe the rumor mill and, and that there is, you know, a lot of evidence or as much as possible that you can find that otherwise it's, it's really dangerous to put that in a story if you don't think it's true and there's a lot of evidence behind it. Something that's so striking about the story of John McAfee is that a lot of journalists have come in and out of this uh, story before. So even document your film, there was a uh, famous case of uh, a vice crew who was following John McAfee after he was fleeing Belize, having been a, uh, a person of interest in a murder, and uh, vice accidentally uh, posted a photograph of him that gave away his geolocation. They didn't accidentally post it. Hmm. They were like, we are with McAfee suckers. And then that was literally the headline of the post. But what they accidentally did was left it, be, it, left it GPS encoded so they hmm. could find his location and realize he went into Guatemala illegally and they arrested him. So like, if you're on you're the, the lam, <laughs> <laughs> don't take reporters who are going to make those kinds of mistakes. Yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so that, I mean, that's but one example of uh, of of reporters who have come in and out of this story, and you know, but and to my knowledge, no one has put together as many pieces as you and your team have uh, in in this film, and and I wonder as as you you know, have studied the, the, the course of reporting on this, you know, what does it tell you about the state of reporting? Well, I, I mean, I think it's really unfortunate, you know, especially being married to someone who's a journalist, you know, all these bureaus have been cut out of the budget, the, you know, it's all about the 24-hour news cycle. So for a moment, when John was on the run and there were these crews following him, and then two weeks later, everybody forgets, and they, there's no interest in reopening it. Um, so as a result of that, a lot of documentary filmmakers have kind of taken that place in our world of, you know, really spending a long time investigating things that, that the media outlets don't normally do and the news doesn't normally do. Because one of the things that's fascinating is that when reporters would, you know, parachute into Belize to, to cover John McAfee or wherever he was, <clears throat> it would be that John McAfee was the story. Um, right. And what you were able to do is tell the stories of everyone who was around him and affected by him. Yeah, I mean, he, he did, you know, enormously affect people on, in his world in Belize. I mean, he created a little kingdom that he lorded over, a very strange kingdom. And, um, and you know, yeah, so you have this point of view of all the people that were affected by him while also trying to give a character portrait of who he was. In today's world of uh, independent documentary filmmaking, um, uh, uh, in contrast to the days when, see, networks were stronger, and, and as a reporter, if you went in somewhere, you had the backing of an organization, of their resources, of their legal team, of you know, other kinds of expertise that, uh, that you might call on. And working as an independent filmmaker, you're, you work with a much more uh, shrunken set of, uh, of resources. Um, what are you talking about? Our budgets are huge. <laughs> no, it's true. Yes. Uh, in, I mean, in your case, who were the, the, the people that you could call upon uh, for, you know, support and even, uh, not even just financial support, but just, you know, what should I do if I need a bodyguard in Belize support? Well, I, I had an amazing team. Um, you know, Chiang, uh, my producer, Michael Hirshhorn, my executive producer, were incredible in supporting me. And, and, you know, I would say, you know, I think it's getting a little sketchy. I think we should have bodyguards. And we would find someone locally that seemed, you know, um, legitimate and, and safe. And we would do that. And as far as there were enormous amount of legal issues on this film that I had never 
um, had to encounter before just because of the kind of accusations that we were making and bringing up. When you watch the film, you'll get what we're talking about. I mean, there, there is, you know, two murders, one which had never been reported before that he is implicated in, um, a rape case. Uh, I mean, there's, there's a lot of stuff. And, and uh, you know, so, so we, we had our own lawyer, and then Showtime actually hired outside counsel as well that specialized in this. Um, and that, that became hugely important in the editing process. And, and, and even, actually, I would just call up and say, like, well, what about, we, we got a whole, um, we had a very long meeting with the, our attorney beforehand about, you know, what you can do and what you can't do and how many sources you need and other evidence and what you need to save and collect and um, you do your due diligence on. Um, and if something would come up, I, for one of the first calls I would make is to the attorney. Uh, just to make sure this is all above board and good. Um, and, and then, of course, it came up more in, in, the, in the editing process as well. Uh, sometimes uh, filmmakers uh, you know, are bristling uh, against uh, the, 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 that kind of oversight. Um, sounds like you appreciated at least some aspect. I very much appreciated it, yeah. I mean, you know, when, you, when you're making a film of this nature that um, is... is basically saying someone committed some very bad acts um, and they should be looked into and further investigated and held accountable, then, then that's a very serious charge and I wanted to make sure that I was doing everything properly. So what were the things that kind of kept you uh, going in this project? Uh, you, you described earlier like there was a point where, you, where it was too late to turn back. <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of people who, who are in the film who have had their uh, lives affected in, in, in serious ways. And, you know, I, it, was that something that was weighing on your mind? It was. It was hugely weighing my mind. Um, you know, going down to Belize and meeting the people and, and you know, seeing that level of poverty and, and how much people had been exploited by him um, very much kept my spirit going and, and my determination going. Um, and, you know, I mean, I was also just sort of amazed when I discovered that his story literally was Heart of Darkness, that he lived in, he decided to move to the jungle on a river and things just got darker and darker, that he had 15 armed security guards, that he imposed a curfew on the local town with his armed guards, that he had a harem of girls, which he, you know, who were really young, you know, 15 to 18, who, you know, uh, he exploited completely as a sugar daddy. I mean, it just, it, it really surprised me how much it felt like this, this, this iconic story that we've all heard of. And it's this idea of the ugly American who suddenly realizes, like, I can do anything. Like, this is the kind of society that's not really prepared to properly investigate things. They've got a whole bunch of other issues, drug deals, murders that they're dealing with. And they kind of stay away from the rich white man. Um, and he just... As he got away with things, he just pushed the envelope further and further and further and further until, you know, eventually he pushed it too far and he had, he realized, like, I gotta go. I mean, all they wanted to do was bring him in for questioning and he went on the run. Like, he knew. He had so many skeletons in his closet, this is my theory, that he just took off um, because, you know, he knew, he knew the, the, the breadcrumb trail he had left. And he was hoping no one would go back. And then we did. So since the film uh, played two days ago, uh, it has, have you heard any reactions from anyone uh, associated with the film? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I, you know, the, the press has been very kind and given the film great reviews. Um, you know, people have seen it, my friends. Um, from his crew, he has, he's sort of developed a, a similar type of entourage in the States. You know, instead of paying people, he... What happened was when he was on the run in, uh, from Belize, he developed a blog, and he seemed almost like this action character, and he pretended that he was a victim of corruption in Belize, and they were out to assassinate him and frame him for a murder. And people got really involved in his blog, and he started befriending them, and they, most of them don't live in the same city. Um, so he has these relationships with people, um, 
So, you know, some of those people have posted things, um, just hearing about what was in the film, and I got a very strange series of emails from Anais Nin, was the name of the email address. <laughs> it seemed like it was him, you know, telling me that he'll be watching me. Uh, it was particularly in response to what my sexual activities might be in the future or now that he needs to uh, make sure that, you know, if, if I didn't do anything kinky, then he would uh, make it up and put it out there for public consumption. So that was interesting. Um, uh, I was like, if you're going to do that, why write it to me for? <laughs> Just do it. <laughs> Uh, the, the film is going to be on Showtime on September 24th, so it, it's a pretty accelerated cycle that, uh, that this is going to be even reaching a wider public. Yes, uh, yeah. yes, and, uh, and, and hopefully uh, abroad as well. We you know, uh, have sales agents that are selling it um, throughout Europe, and yeah, so hopefully it will have, be widely seen. Uh, I want to take a step back and ask you some questions about your, your bigger career. You made this uh, series of documentaries with On the Ropes, Kid Stays in the Picture, American uh, Teen, uh, with some, you know, few years of, of each of those uh, in the making. I think American Teen was 2008 yes. um, uh, when it came out. And if I'm not mistaken, that was your last full-length documentary. You uh, are mistaken. Oh, what, what did I miss? What am I missing? <laughs> well, I did a, a feature-length film for uh, ESPN, a 30 for 30 on Tanya oh, right. Harding. Okay. Uh, but, yeah. So, um, but that, And that was two years ago. But it was, it was five years. But, uh, I, I, I got pregnant um, and when American Team was coming out and had a baby. And the salary of documentary filmmakers is not always in line with raising a kid in New York City. So um, there was some exploration of, okay, what am I going to do? How am I going to balance this? I tried some fiction work, which I didn't enjoy as much. Um, and you directed a fiction feature I did, called I did Going the Distance. I did a studio movie, yeah. a romantic comedy. I'm like, what am I doing? <laughs> and, um, and then, uh, but I had always done commercials and I got very involved in it. And a lot of the commercial work I do is, is non-fiction type, you know, very, with real people. And, and because of the internet, you know, it's not, a lot of times I get hired to do stuff that I'm very proud of that, that doesn't sell anything. Like they're brand logos at the end, but it's an interesting story with interesting characters. And, and I, you know, I, so I, I realized, okay, that can financially help me and it, it, it's fun and, and, and I get to try different things and then I can make documentaries. So I, it, took me, it took me a little while to figure out, but I did. Do you, I mean, you feel like it's still an ongoing process or do you feel like you've got a model now that works? I feel like I have a model, but I also feel like we're, you know, in the entertainment media business, there's no security ever in anything. So um, as much as I can have a model, I feel like I have found a model that works. Mm -hmm. um, Going back to uh, uh, to Gringo, uh, so much of this film is um, is you extracting new information through interviews, mm -hmm. um, and I wanted to ask you about your interview uh, process. Uh, you know, so I mean, in you you do one interview with a former colleague of uh, John McAfee, uh, who alleges that she was raped, uh, drugged, and raped uh, by by John McAfee. Um, can you describe what it took to get that interview and, uh, and, and to do that interview? Yeah, um, I had started speaking to Allison on that subject, um, and I wasn't, I didn't know at the time that that had happened. I knew that she had a company with him in Belize, uh, this natural antibiotics company. She was a uh, postdoc, worked at Harvard, very smart, educated. And he had funded her research in Belize, and it was her dream job. And, and then she suddenly left a couple of years in, and I wasn't really sure what the story was there. So I called her. At first, she was very hesitant to talk to me. Um, uh, it, took a, it took a bunch of phone calls and, and really wanting to know, you know, well, what, what was my take on him? And um, finally, we ended up having this six-hour phone conversation where we really uh, bonded, and she ended up telling me the a whole... six-hour phone a conversation? A six-hour phone conversation, yes. 
I was on vacation in Hawaii, like taking a break from Belize for a couple weeks. And my husband comes back and he's like, did you go to the beach? I'm like, no, I've been on the phone for six hours <laughs> in the condo. I haven't left yet. Um, and, but she told me the whole story. And, um, you know, we talked and I was very surprised. I didn't realize that had happened. And we talked a lot about it. And then I really, I didn't want to push her though to, that's such a, a courageous thing to do and, and something that someone has to decide on their own. But she said, listen, I'm telling you because I really do want to come out with this story because, you know, when something like this happens, you know, where someone has been drugged and raped and, you know, someone, if they haven't dealt with it, they just try to move on in life. But she couldn't with him because he was constantly in the news and she was constantly associated with him from her past with him. So when he was on the run, all the reporters from Guatemala, uh, from uh, America called her and found her on her LinkedIn page or called her at work or, you know, now he's running for president in the United States and she can't hide from this guy. She knows she has to not only deal with it emotionally, but also she felt like, okay, now he's running for president and he's the CEO of a major cybersecurity company and she's seeing this stuff online and there's all these young people like her who are believing in the dream, like I'm gonna do this for you or that for you, and she was worried that he was gonna do the same thing again to somebody else, and she felt like, okay, if I can just save one person and help them, then I'm willing to come out with my story. She, by the way, had gone to the FBI immediately when she got back, um, but because it had happened in Belize and it wasn't a homicide case, they had no jurisdiction to do anything. They were keeping watch on her and you know, told her that she was safe. Um, and she did actually have some evidence, which I did my due diligence on, but I, 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 I told her I wouldn't talk about it. Um, but anyway, uh, unless it had to come up. But, uh, you know, it was so, anyway, I started talking in October. It wasn't until this July that she decided to sit down with me on camera. Um, and I never knew until the last second if she really would. I mean, like, even up until the last second, you know, she was still talking to me about, I don't know, I'm scared. I'm like, it's really up to you. You know, I don't want to push you, but if we're going to do it, we have to do it now. <laughs> um, or we just can't, I won't have time anymore. Um, so she didn't, she, she had spent some months sort of getting her life in order for this. Of she, she changed her job. She's sort of create, you know, she went to serious therapy. You know, she sort of got her house in order in order to do this. It was a big deal for her. Let me talk to you but another interview situation, you interview someone in the film who uh, people have alleged might have committed one or, or maybe two of these murders. Um, how did you prepare yourself for that interview? You mean the second time I met with him, once I had found out that he might have been? Well, either, t uh, either time. Uh, Oh, well, the first time, you know, I knew he would just seem like one of these other guys that had, I mean, work with John, was a gangster, of, somewhat notorious in Belize. Um, but he seemed so sort of mild-spoken on the phone. <laughs> and uh, he, was, um, he was fairly open with me. I don't know. He seemed to be. Um, and... Uh, but the second time I met with him was once I had already had some information that he might have actually done this hit for John, um, um, for this, uh, the American guy who was killed and believes that, that John was uh, implicated in, um, that John had possibly hired this guy and there was evidence of it. And um, People brought that guy's name up. And, yeah, uh, and yeah. People brought his name up and, and said they had wired him money right beforehand and they had to pick him up, but, you know, so now you have to go back and interview him. Now I have to go back and interview him. But I didn't just interview him about that. I ended up re-interviewing about everything. And then at the very end, got to that. And then, and then went they into something wait else. Till the, wait till the end for the tough question. Yes, uh, exactly. Routine. I didn't just launch into that. I was very nervous, too. I was really very nervous. Um, but, uh, and, then, and then... Do you think he was uh, expecting that? I mean, no, you, no. I do not think he was expecting it, no. And he got nervous. He sort of, he was laughing, giggling nervously and wiping his brow a lot. Mm -hmm. and, and I had to be the tough, this is not something I normally do. You know, I'm normally like the em empathic type of interviewer. Mm -hmm. And I had to be the tough investigator, which, you know. Uh, but I, I did, I did try to, you know, uh, 
be as tough as I could um, without having him suddenly attack me across the room or anything. Um, <laughs> fortunately, I had a couple of men on my uh, crew. <laughs> <laughs> Just in case. I don't know what they would have done. But. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and he did come armed every time. He came armed. He was packing. Yeah. So that's of concern. Like, we go to put the mic in him, and it was like, oh, can you just move your handgun over? And there's, like, one in his sock, too. You're like, okay. Did you have bodyguards with you? Not then, no. Uh -huh. That would have been a good time. But <laughs> 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 I think it was after that. I'm like, maybe we should have some bodyguards. <laughs> Wow. Um, we've got uh, a little bit of time left. Let, uh, let's take some questions uh, from the audience. We've got microphones that uh, will come to you. Uh, uh, so is, I see a hand up in the back. Oh, we've got a microphone right here, and then we'll get one to that person in the back. Go ahead. Oh, hello. I, I just uh, must say I'm fascinated by the reactions to being personally threatened. Um, and I don't know if that has ever happened to you in other, uh, other no. film work. Yeah, so, you know, I, I'm trying to imagine myself, you know, I'm a documentary photographer and I have nothing to do with any dangerous subjects. My subjects are inanimate. Uh, so <laughs> I'm just imagining um, at what point do you kind of, at just how it affects you, how it affects your, you know, objectivity. Oh, and when you you know have you thought do you thought think of actually calling the police when somebody's when you have to step away from a window and just wondering if you could elaborate a little on your feelings and how it would affect the film. Right, film. I did not contact the police. I did think about getting a restraining order out on him after that threat, those threats, um, which I then he then wrote me some emails that it's like he completely forgot that he had done any of these threats and seemed um, you know then he was like oh maybe you can interview me but don't ask me any questions about Belize. And I, he just seems... So you didn't want to get a restraining order if there was still a possibility of doing it. I guess so, place. yes. Yeah, that's a really smart decision, but um, safety last. Um, <laughs> no, so I did not take... I mean, but there were times, you know, as I said, when I went back to Belize, a couple, like the last couple times that we did get um, uh, protection. You know, obviously, you have to be a risk taker to be in to be in that business, and at some points, you're, you know, just willing. Like like you said about the restraining order, might have been a good idea to get one, but you, might know, have you would have paid a price for for the film. So, thank right. you. Uh, question back here, microphone's back there. Uh, hello, I was just wondering, um, not knowing this fellow, uh, you know, all new to me. Why did you choose him as a subject in the first place? <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, I had done, um, I, I have a fascination with people that uh, come from money and power and fame and how that affects their life differently. I did a, a film on this movie producer, Robert Evans, who, I, he didn't do that. He, he did actually get implicated in a murder as well at one point. But, and then I had done a film on Tanya Harding, and I, I, I do have a fascination with the privileged, you know, sometimes it's harder for them. They're under the spotlight, but also other times, you know, you can get away with things. And so he was someone I started, I also started following um, when he was uh, on the run and going to Guatemala. There was an amazing Wired article about him, and I started reading all the press about him. And um, so I had a long-term fascination with him. And then when Jeff Wise, the reporter, had unearthed some new contacts and interviews and brought it to me, I thought, well, this is worth looking into. Um, I think especially, like, you know, with Donald Trump running for president and, you know, there's just there's this era in America particularly, I think, um, where uh, it just doesn't, you know, and maybe seeing the jinx and these other subject matters where it, it doesn't seem fair, it doesn't seem equitable that um, if you come from that kind of money, and power, um, and you are a master manipulator of the media, that you can just say, like, oh, that's a hoax, or that was an assassination, or I'm the victim, and then everyone kind of just believes you without really looking any further. There's a real sense in this film of trying to hold someone accountable, someone yes. who, seem, who treats themselves as above accountability. Right. No, it's funny. I was telling someone 
at a kid's birthday party and about the film, they're like, why are you doing this? What are you, like the morality police? And I was like, I guess so. <laughs> I never thought of it. <laughs> In the back of my mind, they were thinking, why is my kid friends with your yeah, kid? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we're going to leave the party now. <laughs> uh, question, uh, whoever's got the microphone over here. Hi. Thank you so much for speaking with us today. Um, I have a feature film in development right now, and it is based on a true story with a lot of illegal activity mm -hmm. and crime. And I was just wondering if you could expand on um, kind of lawyering up. I think that's what's made me very nervous about pulling the trigger on the story is because I know there's a lot of backlash that can come from it. And I just wanted to know about a little bit more about your legal experience. In what sense? In the sense of when you're, you know, what, what can you do and can you not do? I mean, obviously, the individual that we are doing the story on will probably, um, you know, come come after us in a sense. Um, because Litigiously. Excuse me. Litigiously, you mean? Yes. Uh huh. Well, you know, every case is different, so I think it's very important to get the counsel of a lawyer from the beginning um, who has this kind of experience. Everyone's different. Now, if this person is a private citizen who's not running for president and has not like been on every news station ever, um, uh, then they're not a pu and they're not a public figure, so to speak. Then there is a very different um, rules and regulations for lawsuits than if they are someone who's such a public figure and put themselves out there in this way. And then there's all different kinds of categories of, you know, if it's considered defamation, if it's considered, okay, this is privacy issues. So there, I would absolutely counsel you to speak to an informed lawyer in this case um, before you go too far. Uh, question in the back there on the aisle. Yeah, hi. I love This Kid Stays in the Picture. I know it's an older film, but I'm just really curious about your stylistic. <laughs> uh -huh. um, and I haven't seen Gringo, so I don't know the style, but I found you incredibly innovative in that film, and I wonder uh, if you could tell me a little bit of how you came up with that idea, and are you continuing to play stylistically in your docs? Yeah, you know, I mean, it's interesting. Um, and the kid stays in the picture. Robert Evans did not want to be on camera at that time, or any time after that. I mean, he wanted to be remembered as the young, beautiful man that he had been. And so, and Focus Features is financing this film, and it's going to have a theatrical release, and we're like, what are we gonna do with a guy talking off camera for 90 minutes? Like, this is disastrous. So, it really forced me into a box where I had to come up with a, a stylistic way to uh, engage an audience, and it worked perfectly for his story because his story was larger than life, and it was all about, you know, the manufacturing of images. You know, similarly in this film, because I realized I can't interview this man in a traditional sense, I ended up including all, you know, our email communications, which were very enlightening and very reflective of his personality and his tactics. Um, I also included myself in the film as a character, which is something I've never done before. I don't know that I will ever do again. Um, not because it was a bad experience, it's just not something that, you know, I'm not Michael Moore or Morgan Spurlock. I'm, um, I'm just not, you know, someone who, I'm more comfortable behind the camera. So, um, you know, and there were definite, like, there was a lot of imagery in this film, you know, going down the river, so to speak, because of the Heart of Darkness story and the parallels. And so a lot of the imagery and style came from the story. So for me, style is always dictated by content. And I choose the style because it works for that storyline. I don't end up using the same style over and over. It's always dictated by content. All right, uh, getting this gentleman the microphone. Yes, hi. Um, I was just wondering, as a filmmaker, how do you find closure when you're dealing with a subject matter that is still going on, you know? So anything can happen in six months from now, something Part could have two. happened. No. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> 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 well, yeah, besides that. <laughs> yeah, um, you know, I felt like at the end I found enough leading evidence of what I thought had happened in Belize and um, so, you know, it felt like the end of the film was his how he has reinvented himself and, and hoping that 
the sort of threat of that and the danger of that, that this man, and how unusual is that? It, you know, he got away with it. And he's running, you know, he ran for president, he's a CEO of a company, he's respected, he's in the news all the time, thought of as a cybersecurity guru, he has a fan club. Like, to me, that was the ending of the story, hoping that people would do something about it or feel something about it and, and, and feel something about the way that our, our media works and these kind of manipulators work. So that's, uh, that's We've journey. time for one more uh, question. Who's got one? Hi there, thanks a lot. Why do you think he spoke to you? Hmm. Because he is a control freak, um, and he loves, he both loves and hates the media. He has to be in the spotlight, he couldn't deal with, there was this project going on out there, and he needed to be somehow involved. And then he would pretend that he was just messing with me all the time, and, you never knew what the truth was, but that was sort of the point for me. Like, okay, I get this is what you do. Um, so I, yeah, he, could, he compulsively, he would literally say, do not contact me again, and then email me five seconds later. He would do it all the time. He was just compulsive to this day. Oh, and now he said, I never, e after he read the description and the Toronto Film Festival came out, like the next day, and it said there were cryptic emails in the movie, he said, I never wrote those emails even though I signed my name. It was my volunteers, but they were always with me at the same time, so the IEP address would always match. Um, and then he was like, oh shit, now I can't email her anymore. And, then, and so then he had one of accolades send an email saying, this is John's real email address, and you have no idea you're, how lucky you are to have gotten this. Like, I had to wait two years. I was like, what is he, the Wizard of Oz? Like, <laughs> It's a very uh, nutty world. Um, <laughs> uh, Gringo is playing again tonight at 8.30, so uh, I, I hope that your appetite has been awakened uh, to, to see it from this. Uh, before we get off the stage, I want to bring back uh, Dorota Leck to say a few closing remarks, if she's behind that door. I want to give a big thanks to Dorota, who's really responsible for putting this whole day on. Dorota, come out. That's your cue. <laughs> uh, I want to thank you all for joining us for the seventh annual TIFF Doc Conference. It's been a huge success. I would love to thank the CBC and Glenn Gould Studio and their amazing staff for their hospitality. We really, really appreciate it. And I would like to thank all of the TIFF staff that helped make Doc Conference happen this year. So shout out to Lynn Carter, Karina Rodenstein, Neil McPherson, Carter Bruce, Paul Dundas, Bronwyn Eady, Aaron Van Domlin, Talia Harrison Marcassa, Anita Kotick, Jonah Kamhorst, Vanya Garraway, Jason Avis, Krista McIsaac, Robin Richardson, and all of our vol volunteers. Thank you so much. <laughs> Last but not least, I would love to thank Tom, co programmer of the Doc Conference, moderator extraordinaire. Um, And now we invite you to join us in the lobby for a sponsored cocktail. Thank you to Great Big Story for sponsoring the cocktail. See you next year.